outdoor motocross scene, reports from two national events. And we'll go behind the scenes of the recent Honda dealer convention and show you what will be available in 1990. Moto World is next. Welcome to a jam-packed edition of Moto World. Later in the show, we'll have an exclusive look at the recent Honda dealer convention, which showcased some pretty exciting models for the upcoming season. But first, it's off to California for dirt track racing. As Dennis Torres reports, the chase for the coveted number one plate ended recently on the West Coast. With three races remaining in the AMA Dirt Track Championship, the title was still within reach of two riders. Scott Parker, the dominant force in dirt track racing, and his Harley factory teammate, Chris Carr. At the Ascot Half Mile, Carr had to win to have any hopes of derailing the Parker Championship Express. Carr number 20 did just that. Parker, on the other hand, cruised into second on automatic pilot towards his second straight title. Afterwards, both reflected on the San Jose Mile, which was to be run the following afternoon and would probably decide the national championship. If you're going to lose, it's the best thing to lose, lose to is your teammate, you know. And uh, Chris was riding real well and uh, going real fast tonight and uh, looking forward to heading to San Jose tomorrow. Tomorrow, go out and win. That's the only thing I can do if I'm going to win the championship. And, uh, I got to hope that I can score, uh, you know, quite a few points. And uh, and I hate wishing bad luck on anybody, but uh, there's a time for something to happen with Scotty Parker's motorcycle. Now's the time. Unfortunately for Carr, Parker's motorcycle has been tuned to perfection this year by legendary wrench Bill Warner. At the San Jose Mile, Parker was rocket fast and bulletproof. The result? Career national win number 29. Ninth win of the season and career mile win, 18. Former champ Jay Springsteen had a great run for second. Carr ended up eighth. For his championship ride and season, Scott Parker from Schwartz Creek, Michigan, is our Castrol Rider of the Week. The Harley Factory Rider will receive a custom jacket and plaque for being named Castrol Rider of the Week. If Scott Parker wins the final event in Sacramento, he will own the record for most wins in a season. Will he do it? Tune in and find out. Reporting for Motor World, this is Dennis Torres. Team Suzuki presents the Motor World Suzuki Event Calendar. A look at some of the major events coming up in the world of motorcycles and ATVs. $15,000 will be on the line at the Top Gun Motocross Showdown a one-moto format extravaganza in Tennessee on October 22nd. Many of this country's top riders will make the trek to the Mudge Creek facility for a chance at the big loot. One of the largest road race gatherings of the year will take place in Florida on October 28th and 29th. The annual Daytona Pro-Am will feature AMA CCS sprint racing as well as endurance competition. Off-roaders on the West Coast take note. The final AMA National Enduro of the Year takes place on October 29th. Redding, California will be the event site. Still to come on Moto World, an update on the Outdoor Motocross Championships, including exclusive video of a serious crash involving Team Kawasaki's Ron Lachine. The series finale in the Castro Canadian Superbike Championship. And coming up next, a look at one of the fastest men down the quarter mile. Art Ekman has joined me on the set for a drag racing update. Art, what do you have for us today? Well, Larry, to say that Drag Bike USA is one of the busiest sanctioning bodies in all of motorsports would be an understatement. Very few weekends go by without a Drag Bike USA event being held somewhere in the United States. Two of the more significant drag bike meetings were the recent Nitro Nationals in Maryland and the Florida Nationals. Over 100 teams entered the Cycle Shed Nitro Nationals with a variety of equipment that would rival any custom bike show. It was the largest Drag Bike USA turnout in the Northeast this year, and the action was hot and heavy. The big winners on the day, Pennsylvania's Tim Goff and his Kawasaki Ninja in the Pro Stock Eliminator class, and Philadelphia's Sam Parks in Pro Street. Parks was Suzuki mounted. After the Maryland event, it was off to the Sunshine State for the Florida Nationals, where we caught up with Mark Miller of St. Cloud, Florida. The 34-year-old construction company owner is a significant member of the drag racing fraternity. The reason Miller and this Kawasaki turbocharged motorcycle have the quickest time down the quarter mile of any motorcycle in history, 6.98 seconds. This is Miller's new toy. This red, white, and blue monster is a top fuel motorcycle. 
Drag Bike USA is the only sanctioning body that still runs these crowd-pleasing machines. Miller is really pumped up about his new endeavor. Starting out drag racing in the top fuel class, I wasn't very good at all. I, I was trying and trying and doing my best, but I just didn't have what it takes to win. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had people say, you know, you need to stop, get somebody else to ride your motorcycle. I looked at them and said, it's my money. I'm going to have the fun out of it. At that time, it kind of gave me the drive to try harder and, and be good, be the best at what I was at. And Here's a first. A camera mounted on a turbocharged drag bike. Excuse the video quality, but we thought you'd like to experience a seven-second ride up close. Real close. That ride was courtesy of Mark Miller's record-setting 600-horsepower Turbo Kawasaki. Afterwards, the world record holder compared the onboard sensations of his turbo mount to his top fueler. I would say the turbocharged bike is a lot harder to ride because of the weight of it. It takes more movement on the bike, and it's a lot squirrelier running down the racetrack. It, every little cinch in a track, a, a dip or a... Bad marks in the track, I throw the little bike off where the top fuel bike is so heavy it just motors on. It's just like driving to the store in a Cadillac. Somehow, I just can't see General Motors building in that kind of excitement in their caddies. From drag racing, we turn our attention to road racing. Here's Pat Gonzalez with the final round of the Castro Canadian Superbike Championship. This is Shannonville Motorsport Park near Belleville, Ontario, the site of the final round of the Castrol Canadian Superbike Championships. Off the start, Crevier charged to the front with Mercier in second, followed by McMurder in third. Mercier took the lead before the end of lap one and held it until lap number eight when Crevier forced his way by in a turn two. At halfway, it was Crevier in the lead with Mercier second, McMurder in third. Number two, Tommy Douglas of Laval, Quebec in fourth on his Yamaha OW01. And rookie Jacques Gannett in fifth on a Yamaha FZR 600 Superbike. With four laps to go, Mercier was forced off the track by a slower rider at the end of the long back straightaway and got back on the track but in third place as McMurder moved to second. On the last lap, Mercier closed on McMurder and made the pass, pushing his Suzuki back into second. At the checkered flag, number 107, Crevier took his second Superbike win of the year and set a new track record in the process, running his Yamaha at a minute 47.94 seconds. Number 11, Mercier finished second on his Suzuki, while number one, McMurder, was third aboard his Honda RC30. I spoke with Steve Crevier about his amazing season. Yeah, it's been a heck of a season, Pat. I'm real happy, and I guess uh, every one of my sponsors is happy. And um, what can I say? Canada's got some of the hottest racing in the world, I'm sure. So Steve Crevier will carry the number one plate in Canadian Superbike and 250 Grand Prix racing in 1990. From Shannonville Motorsport Park, this is Pat Gonzalez reporting for Motor World. In other road racing news, Californian Fred Merkel holds a slim two-point lead in the World Championship Superbike Series with only two rounds remaining. The reigning world champ has already announced that he's leaving the Superbike Series for the 500cc Grand Prix Wars in 1990. It'd be great to see the Honda rider get that second consecutive world title under his belt before leaving that series, Larry. It really would. I hope that two points will hold up. Thank you, Art. When Motor World continues, we'll update you on the Outdoor Motocross Championships and show you the crash that has put Team Kawasaki's Ron Lachine on the sidelines for the rest of the season. We'll be right back. Welcome back. The Hurricane showed up for round three of the 500cc National Championship Motocross Series, but it was not Hurricane Hannah. You'll recall he retired a few weeks ago. Instead, it was Hurricane Hugo. Now, apparently, Hugo is not a big motocross fan. He showed up a day early and fortunately decided not to stay. The tail end of Hugo rode a few laps of the Broom Tioga course and blew on to easier pickings. Left behind was a virtual swamp that created problems all day long. Now that will ruin your day every time. Let's pick up the action on the opening lap of the 125 class. Mike Kidrowski aboard the Red Honda has the lead, and Damon Bradshaw on the white Yamaha wants it. They disappear side by side. 
but only Bradshaw reappears. Kedrowski later said Bradshaw took him out. Bradshaw said, nah, it was just tight racing. Honda's Guy Cooper, number 10, won the moto with Bradshaw second. In moto number two, Cooper was again on the move, but this time in the wrong direction. We'll blame that one on the mess Hugo left behind. Bradshaw took the moto and his third overall win of the season. The 500 class was a three-way shootout between Kawasaki's Ron Lachine, number four, and Honda riders Jeff Stanton in second and Jean-Michel Bale in third. If you're a regular Motor World viewer, you'll recall Bale is the French rider that came to the States to hone his skills. The Frenchman returned to Europe, won the 250cc world title, and is back in the States for more competition. Bale finished the day second overall. Lachine, meanwhile, after winning Moto No. 1, recorded a DNF due to a broken rear hub in Moto No. 2. The overall win fell to Stanton. Delmont, Pennsylvania was the next stop on the motocross tour. At the Steel City track, Team Kawasaki had a big day with a pair of wins, but lost one of their stars, Ron Lachine, for the season. First, the win. In the 125 class, Jeff Matasevich, number 26, turned in moto finishes of fourth and second to claim his first ever outdoor national win. Honda's Guy Cooper finished second overall, while Ron Tishner aboard a Suzuki was third. With two rounds remaining, Bradshaw has a comfortable championship points lead over Mike Kudrowski and Guy Cooper, who are tied for second in the standings. Rounding out the top five are Donnie Schmidt and Mike LaRocco. In 500 competition, Jeff Ward took the checkered flag in both motos to claim his third overall win of the season. Behind Ward came the recently crowned 250 world champ Jean-Michel Bale, number 111, with Jeff Stanton, rider number seven, third. In the history of U.S. motocross, no rider has ever won all four AMA national titles. So far in his career, Ward has captured 125 and 250 outdoor crowns and the Supercross Championship. With two rounds remaining, the elusive 500cc title is just inches away. Absent from the victory celebration in the Kawasaki pits was Kawasaki rider Ron Lachine. The former national champ crashed hard in the opening moto, suffering a broken right femur. An alert motocross fan with a video camera was on hand to record the incident. Watch again, this time in slow motion, as Lachine is catapulted to the ground. Surgery was required to repair the brake, and Lachine is expected to be sidelined for a minimum of six months. If you overheard a conversation that mentioned Loretta Lynn's Dude Ranch, you could reasonably assume the topic of discussion was country western music or even a rodeo. But as Chris Larson points out, recent visitors to the ranch were there for a weekend of motocross. That's how the AMA's 13th annual amateur motocross championship was billed. For the eighth consecutive year, Loretta and Mooney Lynn hosted the event at Loretta's own private town, Hurricane Mills, Tennessee. As always, there was enough motocross to fill the appetites of the hungriest fans. Nearly 1,000 entrants rode three motos in 27 divisions. Included were the ever-popular Pee Wee class, the seniors, known as the Geritol set, and all ages in between. But motocross alone is not what makes Loretta Lynn's the world's greatest motocross vacation. No, indeed. If it were, any number of events could lay claim to the title. What Loretta Lynn's has is extracurricular activities. And among them, there's always a surprise or two. This year, in addition to softball, horseshoes, volleyball, the chili cook-off, and a host of other things to do, there was, well, for a lack of a better name, we'll call it drag racing. On hand for the activities were the Blues Brothers and a host of international beauty queens. Get the picture? What it really was was a contest to see which guy could look the most like a gal and which gal could look the most like a guy. To say the least, the competition was tight. Do you recognize this raving beauty? How about now as the makeup is being applied? Still don't know? Well, Motor World is not one of those kiss and tell TV shows, but here's a hint. She, uh, excuse me, he's a recently retired Team Suzuki motocrosser. Loretta Lenz, the world's greatest motocross vacation. For Motor World, I'm Chris Larson. <laughs> Welcome back to Moto World. We're in Dallas, Texas, where Honda dealers and members of the motorcycling press have gathered for Honda's 1990 dealer convention. There have been seminars, business meetings, and, well, as you can see, even demonstration rides to try out the new, exciting 1990 line of Honda motorcycles. Uh, we started this demo ride program for our dealers last year at last year's convention, and it was so popular, and it created so much enthusiasm and excitement about our models, that we decided to do it again this year. 
If popularity is the key, the demonstration ride program will be around for years to come. On hand were most of Honda's 1990 lineup, including several brand new models. Well, of the 1990 Honda models, and there are eight or nine brand new ones, I think my favorite is the VFR 750F. It has a liquid-cooled V4 engine, has a very sophisticated suspension, and that makes it a very good sport bike. It handles well and has good power. But more than that, it's very versatile. It has long range, it has comfort, it has a good riding position. So that's why it is my favorite bike. There were a lot of favorite bikes to choose from. Two in particular that attracted a lot of attention were the NS50F, a 50cc liquid-cooled sport yeah. bike aimed directly at affordable fun for the experienced or first-time buyer, and Honda's all-new, sure-to-be-a-big-hit 90cc Cub. It's about as friendly a motorcycle as I've ever hop, hopped on. It uh, doesn't require any shifting. It's very easy to ride immediately. And uh, yet it does enough things to, to give the new rider uh, a good time on his uh, first uh, experience riding a motorcycle off-road. Personally, I found the new Honda Cub fit my riding style to a T. But riding demonstrations were not the main reason Honda dealers assembled in Dallas. Well, I think the, uh, the thing that was interesting to me is that uh, Honda is interested in uh, maintaining their position in the marketplace. And uh, I've got a feel that uh, Honda is willing to do what it takes to uh, maintain that market share. And that was the bottom line of Honda's 1990 dealer convention. Motorcycling is on the upswing, and Honda intends to provide its dealers with the tools to maintain the momentum. It's still basically up to the dealer. Honda can only do so much, but uh, we intend in our area, in Northern Nevada, to do a couple of the fun day things in conjunction with Honda and the demo units. And uh, once people ride the motorcycles and realize that they're fun, I think we'll have a lot of new customers. Fun days are just what the name implies. On a national and dealer level, motorcyclists will be encouraged to tell a friend of the joys of riding motorcycles and get them involved in a day of fun. In other words, come ride with us. That theme, according to Mr. Amamiya, president of American Honda Motor Company, will carry Honda dealers into the 90s. Oh, yeah, very much so. And uh, it creates excitement for us and the customer too. To make sure the message was received loud and clear, Honda added to its all-star cast of cycles an all-star cast of messengers. Multi-time national dirt track champion Bubba Schobert on the left, World Road Racing champ Eddie Lawson on the right with convention hostess Suzanne Summers. After two days of tire kicking, product presentations, and demonstration rides, Honda said adios with a gala western party complete with Texas barbecue and a two-step band. <laughs> the message Honda dealers took home from the 1990 convention was clear. Motorcycling is alive and there are fun days ahead. Tell a friend. <laughs> Before we leave you today, a Moto World program note. On the October 22nd and 29th editions of Moto World, we'll have exclusive highlights from the 64th International Six Days Enduro from Waldern, West Germany. Moto World cameras were on hand in Germany to capture all the flavor of this prestigious international motorcycle event referred to as the Olympics of motorcycling. For six long days, the world's best off-road riders competed over some of the most challenging European terrain. How did the American contingent fare? Tune in and find out. Until next week, don't forget to keep your wheels on the ground and your feet on the pegs. For everyone here at Moto World, I'm Larry Myers.